This is Get Real with Bob and Stacy, the show that helps you learn about the mortgage and real estate markets. Get the inside scoop from their expert list of guests and have some fun along the way. Now, here's Bob Callagher and Stacy Alcorn. Welcome back. You're listening to Get Real with Bob and Stacy. You're joining us for our Leaders and Legends segment. And our guest today is Jason Cooper, CFA charter holder and portfolio manager at Stuyvesant Capital. Welcome to the show, Jason. Thanks, Bob. Stacy. nice to be here. Thank you. So I want to give background on Jason. He joined Stuyvesant Capital Management Corporation, a portfolio manager, in 2012. He is responsible for constructing separately managed accounts, conducting research on the firm's core and potential holdings, updating his proprietary valuation models and asset screens, and running the financial planning division. Jason completed the CFA program in a three-year period. In 2012, he graduated cum laude from Cornell University, where he completed the pre-med program and received a BS in animal science. Jason has been featured on thestreet.com and U.S. News and World Report. So before we have you um, talk about value investing in layman's terms, we need to, because we've brought it up, that you have... You are in animal science. So tell us how you ended up getting a degree in animal science and ended up in portfolio management. Right. So originally it was a dual thing where I majored in animal science and completed the pre-med background. Mm -hmm. Originally I was very interested in pursuing a career analyzing uh, data Mm -hmm. within the medical community, uh, perhaps pursuing an MD, PhD. And in my undergrad career, I noticed that within the animal science research division, uh, you spend a lot of time outside uh, with the animals. The process of data collecting really comes down to choke holding 100 ewes twice Mm -hmm. a week for six hours. Uh, It's not very enjoyable, and you spend more time with animals than you do other people. So I decided to take the data analytic ability that I developed and move it over to the financial world where I get to sit inside in front of a comfortable computer and perform the same type of statistical analysis. And you do not have to choke hold a U. Is that what it was? I could see the wanting to be Uh, in air conditioning and heated quarters as opposed to being in a field. Every once in a while I might have to choke hold a U, but that's just in my free time. (laughs) 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 All right. So let's talk about what is value investing. So value investing is actually a style of investing that was really established by Benjamin Graham uh, during the Great Depression. For those of you that aren't familiar with the man, he's actually Warren Buffett's mentor, so he was very influential on modern-day investing. What was his name? Benjamin Graham. Okay, Benjamin Graham. Okay, go ahead. Uh, He wrote two books that are very famous, Security Analysis and The Intelligent Investor. They're read by probably at every major financial analyst now. Uh, And his theory was really that you need to find a security that trades at a significant cushion to its intrinsic value. Uh, If you invest in something that is priced cheaply, whether it's relative to its cyclical earnings, its cash flow, the net assets of the company, there's an embedded margin of safety that'll allow the investor to outperform on a risk-adjusted basis. Uh, That's actually, that, that has actually been proven to be relatively true, as value investors over a longer time horizon do tend to outperform their competitors on a risk-adjusted basis. Uh, That's not the easiest thing to conceptualize, so it's much easier to compare value investing to its counterpart, which is growth investing. The two main style, those are the two main styles in the investment world, and every single stock in the S&P 500 is characterized now as either a value stock or a growth stock. Hmm. There are a few main criteria that are helpful in understanding these classifications. Value stocks, um, they're usually more cyclical businesses, so you'd expect the earnings to be more volatile over the typical business cycle. Some examples of businesses with cyclical cyclical earnings are industrials, energy, um, certain financials like banks and home builders. Growth companies on the other hand, tend to have more stable business models, and the growth rate tends to be higher than that of the market. Uh, The technology sector is most closely associated with growth stocks. 
Um, hmm. Other more stable sectors like telecoms and utilities are also considered growth. And when you think about these companies, the demand for their products is more inelastic. So you know if the economy were to deteriorate, people would eat into their savings to maintain you know, a certain mm-hmm. degree of their lifestyle. They don't want to live without electricity, and I'm sure most of our listeners don't want to live without their phones. Um, because of the different natures of these businesses, investors will tend to use different valuation benchmarks in determining where they think the security should trade. Value stocks, which have greater volatility in their earnings, uh, a good example of the volatility would be home builders aren't, aren't really able to sell too many homes when an extraordinary proportion of the population is unemployed. It's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. And as a result, they tend to garner a, less, a lesser price-to-earnings multiple. Uh, investors are less willing to pay for the same amount of earnings because it's less clear that in the future they will be able to continue to grow their earnings. Um, growth stocks tend to just continue this steady and superior growth rate in earnings, And as a result, investors will tend to pay up for the securities. This tends to hold true uh, when you also compare how how much they're willing to pay for the equity in the company. Value investors or value stocks tend to have lower price-to-book multiples, while growth stocks tend to have much greater price-to-book multiples. So the theory is that if, if value investing is done correctly, investors will be able to generate returns on a risk-adjusted basis in excess of their benchmark over a longer time horizon. Hmm. So are you saying that it's just now that the financial community is beginning to embrace value investing? I'd say that's correct. It really started last year, which was the first Hmm. year since 2009 that value outperformed growth. Um, There's a lot of speculation as to why it hadn't outperformed in such Mm -hmm. a long time. Theories range from depressed bond rates Mm -hmm. to uh, a change in how the economy tends to work. Uh, I I would support the former, that the depressed interest rate structure tended to favor growth investments. Mm -hmm. Um, But last year when they started outperforming, there was really a lack of ownership of value stocks. Managers that had been value managers or strict value managers for a long time had lost many clients. A lot of them had gone out of business. Mm -hmm. In order to stay in business, even more value managers tended to have style drift. Uh, They would have certain value stocks, but they would really go out and buy growth stocks just to make sure that they weren't underperforming the market by too much. Mm -hmm. As a result, there was vast under-ownership of value stocks, and when the catch-up occurred, it occurred with a vengeance, as the value index uh, for the S&P had really significant outperformance for the S&P growth index last year. Hmm. I don't know. Sometimes I think, maybe because I'm not a savvy investor at all, that the growth stocks are just companies that seem more exciting. Like the tech sure. stocks. Uh, if you're going to a mm-hmm. cocktail party, it's a lot more fun to talk about uh, a company that you think is going to grow mm-hmm. 20 to 35 percent a year uh, on the top line or right. on the bottom line, uh, as opposed to talking maybe about an agricultural fertilizer company. Right. Yeah, I don't want to. <laughs> I can't invest in agricultural. No yeah. matter. Fertilizer is just not that know, interesting. Whatever. Even if interest, I lose some money. The interest that investors or that you that you mentioned with mm-hmm. these growth stocks tends to lead investors to pay more for the security. Huh. And while the market's chugging along, that's fantastic. Mm-hmm. But at some point, the market corrects. Mm-hmm. And the question is, how much risk are you taking? Value investing tends to minimize risk. It may not be as exciting or as interesting, mm. very methodical process, hmm. but it tends to work over the long haul. Wow. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I'm more interested in the earnings than I am about the conversation about the company. Well, that's why you don't have a lot of friends, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> You're still mad because I wouldn't have a drink at lunch yesterday, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> You're just the type of person that would invest in one of these value companies. <laughs> Smart. I'm going to take that as a compliment. Yes. Smart. 
I think that is a compliment. <laughs> yes. So will value investing continue to lead the market, you think? Uh, I, I believe so. I saw an interesting study prepared by MRB Partners recently. They, they found a pretty strong correlation between the 10-year Treasury yield and relative performance of value compared to growth. Um, that means that when yields are going down, growth tends to outperform, and when yields are increasing, value tends to outperform. Hmm. Given the state of the economy, um, currently we're running very close to potential GDP, which means that there's been a narrowing in the output gap. When this occurs, you would expect inflation to pick up and for real growth to grow less than uh, inflation. Mm -hmm. And this tends to buoy yields, especially with respects to the inflation component. Mm -hmm. Uh, The relationship is derived really from fundamental reasonings. Uh, When you value these growth stocks, you have a much longer time horizon, which means that you're discounting returns to the shareholder over a much longer period of time. So if yields rise, the opportunity cost of holding those growth stocks compared to value stocks, which you might only value over a three- to five-year period, really tends to negatively impact the growth stocks' present value more than uh, value stocks. Hmm. So given the trend in interest rates, I would certainly believe that value would continue to outperform growth. Hmm. Okay. So what criteria would somebody like me use in appraising a value manager? Barron's had a very interesting take on this at the beginning of the year where they actually suggested maybe investors start to look for value managers. Um, They emphasized that managers should have low portfolio turnover, which means that it's more of a buy and hold. The stocks in your portfolio at the beginning of the year will tend to reflect stocks in the portfolio at the end of the year. Mm-hmm. Um, a turnover of around 30% would indicate that 30% of the shares held at the beginning of the year were subsequently sold and reinvested. Mm-hmm. So the lower, the better. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. You also want to have a large active share. As I mentioned, there is the S&P value index and the S&P growth index. Mm-hmm. A lot of managers will tend to mimic the index. It's almost called core management. Uh, They aren't really taking an active risk. You want a manager that's going to go out there and find securities that they think trade at a significant discount to intrinsic value. And you want those securities to make up a majority of your portfolio. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you will essentially have the index return and you're paying active management fees. Hmm. Uh, when evaluating a manager, it's also helpful to look at their performance over a longer time horizon. Mm-hmm. Anybody could get lucky over a one- to three-year period, but having something statistically significant like outperformance over a 15- to 20-year period uh, really shows that that manager probably sticks to what they're doing. They don't exhibit style drift, mm-hmm. and they also uh, ha- have a process, a disciplined investment process that they're able to use to generate performance in, hmm. uh, performance in excess of the benchmark. Interesting. Hmm. All right, this is off topic, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just Googled a you. <laughs> oh, it's a female sheep. So do they draw blood for male sheep too? Uh, yeah, the study that I was conducting was looking at progesterone levels in female sheep. I think we had 96 ewes. Uh, so that's really a hormone oh. that, that's found in, in females. We were mm-hmm. trying to determine if a specific breed uh, exhibited diesterous, which meant that they were able to lamb uh, twice a year relative mm-hmm. to once a year, because if you're able to find a species that can do that uh, more consistently, it's mm-hmm. more profitable to the, for, to the farmer. This is crazy. <laughs> this is like all of everything you've talked about from value investing to use is mind blowing. It is. It well, is. I ne- you never thought about all the data yes. that they look for, even when it comes to farming or that's crazy raising livestock. Mm-hmm. All right. So last question of the day. We only have a couple more minutes. Why would an investor choose a value manager over just doing passive investments? That's a good question because a lot of investors have been moving towards the passive 
uh, area. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm an active manager, so I think that there's going to be a little bit of bias mm -hmm. in my rationale, mm -hmm. but I think that it follow, tends to follow logic. Uh, I guess I'd start by saying that one of the best value managers who's actually up there in Massachusetts, Seth Klarman, recently said the inherent irony of the efficient market theory is that more people believe in it and correspondingly shun active management. Hmm. The more inefficient the market is likely to become. Hmm. So I think that what he means is that as passive management takes a, a greater and greater chunk of the funds, you're going to end up having uh, securities that deviate from their intrinsic value. And a, w a way to think about this is to consider what happens when you make a passive investment. That passive investment tends to mimic an index, in most cases, the S&P 500. When you think about how the S&P 500 is constructed, it's based on a market capitalization. So a company like Apple, which is the largest company in the S&P 500, accounts for about 3.5% of the index. That means that out of every single $100 you invest, $3.5 automatically go to Apple. Uh, mm -hmm. That happens irrespective of its subsequent performance. Uh, there's no rationale for allocating money in that way. It just happens. When you think about how a market works, you're bringing together investors that have different risk and reward profiles. You have eliamazonary funds like uh, church endowments. You have defined benefit pension plans. You have high-frequency traders, short-term investors, long-term investors. Each one of those investors is going to assign a different valuation on the security. And because of that, you, you get what is termed price discovery. They evaluate where a security should be trading based on all the data. Passive management doesn't use any of that. It tries to basically ride the coattails of active managers. Mm -hmm. So since 2009, passive management has gone from less than 20% of funds to now over 30%. If it continues at that rate, it'll be close to 50% by 2030. Mm. The question is, how efficient is the pricing mechanism going to become? Are the passive managers going to distort the market? If so, that make, then it provides more opportunities for active managers to go in there where the securities are mispriced and take active positions. Um, moreover, active managers tend to have a portfolio turnover between 30 and 60% while passive managers have a portfolio turnover probably between 2 and 3%. Oh, wow. So mm -hmm. I would expect that as passive management continues to take more market share, you're going to have a, a very uh, illiquid market. So the deviation between securities and their intrinsic value is going to be significant, and the rate at which they t tend to move towards their intrinsic value as events uh, unfold and active managers buy or sell the security will tend to increase the volatility within the market. Huh. Um, another interesting fact is that a, an article in the Financial Times recently pointed out that passive managers, because they tend not to buy and hold their securities but tend to trade, have generated returns of 2.85% over the last 15 years. That's compared to 4.04% for active managers. Now, if they did buy and hold, they would have been able to uh, generate 4.98%. But it seems that passive managers, more often than not, have been notoriously poor market timers, and that mm. has impacted their returns over a longer period of time. Mm. Oh. Interesting. We're, we're just about out of time, uh, Jason. We want to thank you for joining us on the show today. And oh, Thank you for having me. Where can people find you? Oh, they can feel free to... Go to my website, www.stuyvesantcapital.com, to learn more about value investing. We also publish quarterly investment outlooks, which mm -hmm. highlight how we view the macro economy, as well as the bond and stock and uh, international stock markets. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And all of our contact information is there. Great. Great. Thank you so much. Great. We're going to take Thanks a quick. We're going to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with more Get Real after this.